information about our church. And uh, it, we're going to watch a video. Uh, many of you watched, saw the video last week. We're showing it again in case uh, we have some people who didn't see it last week that kind of promotes, introduces, I should say, the uh, um, youth program the, for the students. And so we're going to show that video and then uh, we'll open there and pray. chance to, you had to run off after service. This week you have another opportunity, go grab uh, Rob and Carrie, introduce yourself if you don't know them, say, hey, how can I pray? How can I help? How can I serve? What do you need um, as we come alongside them and what we are doing as a church to reach the neighborhood students and, uh, and the students of this community? Because uh, last time I checked, God cares a whole lot about the students around us, doesn't he? Last time I checked, boy, I'm going to start preaching here in a minute, i got to stop. Uh, last time I checked, to reach students, and when they're young, <laughs> with the gospel of Jesus Christ, can radically change the whole direction of their life and destiny, and that is our prayer. Right? Amen. Okay, with that, hey, we're going we're gonna to spend some time singing, we're going to spend some time listening, and we're maybe giving, it, 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 all that is called worship. We're coming together to worship our one true holy God who loves us so much that he died for us, so that anyone who calls on his name is saved. I don't know about you, but I don't care how old I get, how long I've been following Jesus, that is really, really good news, and it is reason enough to sing glory and praise in his name, and that's what we're going to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we get to come here today, that we get to be a part of what you're doing in our, in our midst and in our community. We are fully and wholly dependent on you this morning, fully and wholly dependent on you and what you and our part in what you're inviting us to do, whether that's with the students or whether that's with our neighbors, whether that's with the family. But above all, God, we just ask that our lives, that our morning today would be and bring glory to you and you alone. We love you, Jesus, in your name and pray. Amen. Please stand if you're
Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Oh, 
jealous. How many guys have seen a rocket for lunch? Oh, oh, now I'm really jealous. What was it like? I'm going to pretend we have time for this. What was it like? <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Light that Roman candle. Yeah. See, see, that's what I want. I want to go and I want to see that. I want to be there. I want to feel it. I want to hear it. I want to watch it. So on May 30th of this year, obviously you guys remember, what happened? Falcon 9 with, with two astronauts for the first time in nine years, US, uh, US soil launched on the way to the, uh, onto the International Space Station, right? Right. Man, so here I am, you know, of course, I'm watching it, right? And I'm watching and Sail is watching it with me. Of course, you know, open the door, run outside. Maybe I can see it. I'm look, kind of looking. I think I was looking in the right direction. <laughs> Probably not. Uh, I'm looking towards Argentina or something. But, of course, I didn't see anything, but I was like all excited to come back in, watch a little bit more, go back out. It was cool, right? I want to go and I want to see it. I just want to feel it and hear it. And now I'm, you have people that I'm jealous of. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> now, but we've all done this. Imagine you get to be an astronaut and you get to climb into that capsule and they light off that firecracker. The Falcon 9, my research is right, 1.7 million pounds of thrust. I, I'm not an expert, but that sounds like a lot. <laughs> Capable of propelling. The, these two astronauts in the, in the capsule that they're in, propelling them out of the Earth's orbit and onto the space station, right? Now, what a ride. Now, I've, I've ridden in fast cars. I've driven fast cars. I've been on a fast bike. I've gone in fast boats a lot. Um, my favorite part of flying is takeoff because, man, they put the hammer down. You just sunk into that seat, right? And I, I really like it when they're on short runways because then they're just hammering it, right? They're not trying to save fuel. Forget that. Let's go. That's what I want. So to me, imagine that like you stood on top of a rocket. That would be fun. Now, uh, my research, just because you know it's fun, we have lots of time. We got to what four? Uh, and uh, Saturn V back in the seventies, this huge rocket. I mean, I'm going to read my notes. If Falcon 9 had 1.7 million pounds of thrust, the Saturn V had 7.6 million pounds thrust to, to propel the payload. Hey, let me, I have a Ford Focus, right? Park right over here. All right? I have a Ford Focus. That rocket, if you took 33 of my Ford Focuses and, and plopped them on top of the rocket. Now, there's many days where I want to put my car on top and launch it into space. But that rocket is so powerful it can move 90,000 pound payload to the moon. Even more if you just want to get it into orbit. Imagine that. Now that's a lot of force. That's a lot. That's a pretty significant influence, right? That's the Archimedes lever on it. Hey, give me enough big enough rocket, I can launch it into space. Give me a big enough lever. You guys know where I'm going. Okay. So aren't you glad you came today? It's trivia night here at Church of the Way. Be sure to uh, tip your waiter as on your way out. So here we are. We are walking into the, we're beginning our study on the next couple of weeks on the books of First and Second Kings. And as you know, we've been walking through each book of the Bible, really, kind of giving an overview of each book with the goal and intention that, that as we get an overview of the book, we can understand the book a little bit more as we read it in the following week with the intention and hope and prayer that in our reading God's Word, we get a little bit more understanding that His Word would begin to change us into who He wants us to be. We would be transformed by God's very Word to us. And so here we are in First and Second Kings. Now, um, context and structure, real quick. First and Second Kings, like First and Second Samuel and First and Second Chronicles, both were, were originally, they're just one book. And then a long, long time ago, probably for like publication limitations, they chopped them into two, so now we have First and Second Kings. But they're really just one book, okay? So you can read, and probably should, First and Second Kings as one book. And so as we tackle the, these books this week and next week, we're going to treat them as one, okay? Does that make sense? No, no big deal? Okay. Uh, and so to that end, to help us a little bit, I have two handouts, because today you get gifts, right? Ooh. That's right. That's how we roll around here. So you have two handouts. The first one uh, is Kings and Prophets, and please forgive my uh, also 
uh, professional copy job. Um, it was the best resource I could get, and I couldn't get a clean copy uh, exactly, but I trust it'll be helpful. So this is from Rose Public Publishing, a great little resource book that uh, you can, I'd encourage you to pick up. Uh, but you'll notice it goes, it moves from top to bottom, uh, kings and prophets, and so King Saul, we've talked about him, King David, we talked about last week, and then his son, King his Solomon, will become the king, and that's where we're going to tackle today. And then uh, a dramatic, dynamic, tragic event happens, and the nation of Israel is ripped into two, and you have the northern tribes, and you have the southern tribes, the northern tribes of Israel, and the southern tribes of Judah, each end up having their own king, and so what you have is a list of the kings that are recorded in the books of First and Second Kings. You see where this is going? Make sense? So far? And so if the timeline goes top to bottom, and then get this, ready? Turn it over. Oh. Because of publication limitations, I had to do it on two sides, whereas normally it would go all the way down to one, to one big long one. And so it continues on. Now, uh, secondly, there's another handout, another page. Um, chronological order of the books of the Bible. To me, this is helpful. When I'm reading the Bible, particularly like the Old Testament, it helps me to place the book that I'm reading in its chronological history. Right? So, you'll notice we, we are in the book of Kings, and so we, we're not quite there yet, but we can literally see the chronological end of the Old Testament. But there's, if you look in your Bible, there's a whole bunch of other books. So how does that fit? Well, this is how it fits. Does that make sense? Um, real quick, uh, you'll notice that maybe like the book of Joel, between the two pages, the time for the, the dating of the book of Joel and maybe a couple others, is a little different. That's because Joel doesn't talk, give itself a specific time and date. And there's a little bit of question about it. And so the, the one publication puts Joel at the end of the Old Testament and the other one puts it kind of in the beginning of the, the what's this, the schism, the, the division. How's that work? Um, I am inclined to an earlier dating, but that makes me sound like I'm an expert, which I'm not. And uh, But I'm inclined to that, and it's not that big a deal, but I just want to point that out in case you say, hey, wait a minute, these things are different. So that's why. Okay, make sense? Are we good so far? Okay, back to First Kings. All right, this is where it gets good. At least in my head, and I hope it does for you. Um, now, Kings, the book of First Kings and First and Second Kings starts off where First and Second Samuel ends. So remember, the, in Second Samuel, King, the King of Israel is King David. Now, First Kings starts off with King David is now old. In fact, he's dying. And so Israel, who's going to be their next king? And there's a couple set of events. And, and Israel is going to now have their next king is King Solomon. Now, this first section of kings, because you can divide the books of 1st and 2nd Kings, if you combine them, you can divide them into three parts. The first part is, I'm going to slow down because I'm getting pretty worked up, sorry. The first section, the main first section is 1st Kings chapter 1 to 1st Kings chapter 11. And those chapters cover the life of King Solomon, right? So, and you remember this, and you'll see this when you read it this week. Um, first, these, King Solomon is a phenomenal, this king is like incredible. In Israel, and I've talked about this, Israel reaches its peak of a monarch in monarchy with King David. But as far as a nation, as far as its, as its wealth, as far as its power and international influence, as far as all this, it reaches its peak under King Solomon. Right? And so when you read the first 11, 10 chapters in 1 Kings, you'll see uh, Solomon building this massive temple to God, and it's just gorgeous, and there's these huge descriptions of the glory and splendor and the materials and the measure of, of the temple of God, where Israel is now to come and worship a permanent place for Israel to worship the one true God, right? And he goes on, he builds other massive building projects. Um, he Remember, Solomon is, how, what is he characterized as? what man in the whole world for all He's wisest. the wisest guy. Now, now, where does that come from? What's that? Well, that's all found in this first section, right? He's the wise, he's the wise guy. No, no. <laughs> right? So, but we, we find that. He, he honorably, he, he nobly asked, God says, what do you want? He says, you know what? I want wisdom because I'm in charge of the leading this great nation of yours and I need wisdom. And God says, you know what? You've asked for a really good thing. I'm going to give it to you in space. And then you, you read stories of of his wisdom in action and practice. It's really good, right? 
Now, that's the first section. Chapter 11, by the way, the end of the first section, we see the fall and the demise of this great King Solomon. Does this pattern sound all too familiar? <laughs> David? Uh, I don't know, uh, Samson? I mean, just go right on up, like, ah. And what ends up happening when you start the second section of the books, in chapter 12 of verse 16 that goes all the way through chapter 25 of 2 Kings, is the story of Israel that is now ripped into two. It has been, it has been severed by the judgment of God because of Solomon's sin. We'll touch on, talk about that in a minute. And what you have in the second section is really kind of like a seesaw, where, where now you have two nations with two kings, two leaderships. In fact, they have two places of worship. They have two governments. I mean, it's just incredible, right? And, they're, and oftentimes they're at civil war with each other, and they're being attacked by other nations, and it's just going from bad to worse, and things are deteriorating. And you have the account of, like, the book, the text will, will seesaw kind of back and forth between now the king of Judah, meaning the, the, the tribes of Judah that are over here, or the king of Israel, meaning the, the ten northern tribes. So you see these accounts between the different kings, right? And so that's what, for me, that's why one of the handouts helps when I'm reading this. It's like, oh, you know, King Manasseh or King Ahab or King, you know, Asa or, or you know, Josiah. Where, who is he? And which, which, I can't keep a track. I can't keep track of who and where. That's where the chart helps out. It's like, okay, King of Judah. And here was the prophets that were, maybe the, some of the prophetic books that were written. That's his, they kind of follow this timeline. Okay, so they, they seesaw back and forth on the accounts of who it's talking about. And what happens in the particular, that by the end of the second section, is the tr northern tribes of Israel, their sin is so great that God judges them and says, all right, to keep my word, you will be crushed, you will be scattered, you will be sent into exile. And so the horrible nation of powerhouse of Assyria comes down and crushes the northern tribes. And, and then, okay, so now the southern tribes, they hold out a little bit longer, and they um, follow God a little bit more, and so they last longer, but ultimately they follow the same suit, and the story of their time after the northern tribes are gone is in the third section of 2 Kings chapter 18 through the end of the book, which follows Judah. And at the end of that, what happens? The Babylonians come in, and they crush Judah. They crush Judah. Jerusalem. They cry. Now, back up for just a minute. In these, in this one book, in the first and second kings, we have gone from the peak of Israel's power and influence and glory and splendor and wealth and, and, and military might. I mean, it's it's boom right there. And in the course of this one book, by the end of it, Israel ceased to ceases to exist as a nation altogether. Do you, do you see the, like, what? And here are these, this, these books give us the reasons of how and why that all happened. Make sense? This, it's like, you, you know, Judges was a hard book to read. Kings? Not too easy as well. However, there's tremendous hope in the middle uh, in these books, uh, particularly when you look at the chronologically, if you look in the chart, you'll see that First and Second Chronicles is written during this same timeline and it accounts for the same events. And in the middle of First Chronicles chapter 17, there is a reiteration of the promise God made to David of a future Messiah that would come and sit on the throne forever, that would be the salvation for both Israel and all mankind, for anyone who calls on his name to be saved. It's all right. So, Kings tells us why. Now, obviously, there's material here in these books for months and months of sermons. If I'm honest, I've had a, a challenging time trying to figure out what I wanted to pull out of this book for us this morning. And I want to key in on one theme, re one repeated theme um, that I found in this book that I, hope, I pray will be helpful for us. Let me illustrate it through, first, the life of Solomon. Okay? Solomon. Now, David... Uh, has a son through, with Bathsheba, by the way, named Solomon. 
and uh, he ends up becoming king. And David turns to his son, and he commends, he commands his son. He says, listen, Solomon, follow God. Walk in his ways. Do you remember when we read Judges? How were the judges evaluated? Was it by their, their power or their miracles? Or how were they were evaluated by how they walked with God, right? And the kings, when you read the stories and the accounts of these kings, they are each evaluated not by their military power, not by their economic success, not by anything other than whether or not they walked in the ways of the Lord, whether or not they followed God, whether or not they, they listen. Okay, God has given us the laws we've studied in the Pentateuch before. He's given us, and we are commanded to follow him. The kings were evaluated by how well they did that. And so David looks to his son and says, David, or Solomon, you will be king. Here's, here's, my, here's my parting wisdom, as was told to me by God himself. Follow God. Allow him to guide your steps and walk in obedience to him wholeheartedly. And the beauty of it is that Solomon actually does. At least initially. Turn to uh, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 57. First Kings chapter 8, verse 57 and following. Now, the, what's going on here is Solomon is praying to God. He's given a prayer of dedication that the temple is being completed. And he's, he's praying to God. He's about ready to dedicate the temple. And this, listen to this, just this one portion. Chapter 8, verse 57. And it says, May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he never leave us nor forsake us. May he turn our hearts to him to walk in all his ways and to keep the commands, decrees, and regulations he gave our fathers. And may these words of mine, which I have prayed before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God day and night. May he uphold the cause of his servant and of the cause of his people Israel according to each day's needs. And here, here's a key verse in my mind, verse 60. So that, God answer these prayers, may he answer all these prayers, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God and that there is no other. But your, but your hearts must be fully committed to the Lord our God to live by his decrees and obey his commands as at this time. This sounds like a king who, who gets it. This sounds like a king who said, listen, I'm king, and this is where we're going. And I read that, and we're like, I'm in, I'm following you. And God smiles. Now, here's my question. Who is influencing Solomon at this time? Who is he listening to at this time in his life? God. God, right? He, he's learning and he understands in his wisdom and in his knowledge he, who God is, what his decrees are, what his commands are. And he says, listen, I want to follow him. I'm trusting in him. He has rulership over my life and even over my rulership over Israel. Right? Okay, but then turn a few pages over to chapter 11 of 1 Kings. Chapter 11, verse 1. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter. The Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Sidonians, the Hittites, they were from the nations about which the Lord had told Israel, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods with a lowercase g. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. Yeah. That's <laughs> I ain't touching that one. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. You see the tragedy? As he grew old, his wives turned his heart to other gods. And his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. He followed Ashtoreth, Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eye of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely, as David his father had done. Continuing on. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemesh, or Chemesh, the, the detestable god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. He did the same for all his foreign wives 
who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their God. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. And although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So the Lord said to Solomon, listen to this, Since this is your attitude, and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, for the sake of David your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. Yet, I will not tear the whole kingdom from him. He will give him one tribe for the sake of David my servant and for the sake of Jerusalem which I have chosen. Why is Israel going to get ripped into two? Because Solomon in his old age started listening to someone else. Solomon in his old age was being influenced by someone else. And the, truck and the nation is ripped apart. Now notice, by the way, did you see the hope? Because for the sake of your father who? David. David God says, I will not. Right? He, he says, I'm going to... And what he's doing is, is he's linking back to the promise that God made to David. God will keep his word even in Solomon's disobedience and rebellion. He'll keep his promise to David. We're going to talk about that more next week. Okay. Now. Uh, Corinthians reminds us that bad company cor corrupts what? Bad company corrupts good character. Paul says in Corinthians, listen, bad company <laughs> will influence you. Wow. So who was influencing Solomon in his later years? Was it God? And what were the consequences? Interesting, by the way, uh, David's, uh, David's sin, we kind of see it as like this, this boom, this splash, like boom, he's like, whoa, just this dramatic fall, and almost instantaneously. Was Solomon's like that? As he grew older, over years, these little steps, he listens to, I mean, maybe it's his first wife who doesn't love God and worships him. Okay, all right, I'll let that slide. She's really cool. I really like her. Okay, we're all right. Hey, nothing happened. I'll do it again. You see where I'm going? Because Solomon refused to allow God to be his sole influence, primary influencer, ultimate influence in his life. I wonder, by the way, if he began to drink his own Kool-Aid Look at all that I've done. Look at my power. Look at this great palace. And look at this great whatever. And I have all these wives and all this wealth and all this blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And here's the theme that I find repeated over and over and over again through this book. It is the theme and the principle of influence. Okay. As you read past Solomon, you see these accounts of these different kings just as the judges had, there were many, many wicked kings. In fact, the northern tribes, by the way, it's characterized as saying they didn't have any good kings. These kings had tremendous influence over their nation and over generations and even over other nations. Let me, let me give you an example of this. Solomon's son, after Solomon dies... His son Rehoboam becomes king over Israel. Now, Rehoboam, probably because Solomon, towards the end of his life, he is being like pretty oppressive to the to the Israelites, and he's like high taxation, and he's got all this stuff he's got to maintain. And so the people look at Rehoboam and say, "Listen, we you, we are being taxed too heavily. Can you let up a bit?" And Rehoboam he listens to the wrong set of people. He listens to the yes men in his life, by the way, and they say, no, correct, be, you know, be even harder on the Israelites. Do not give in. Do not relent. And what happens? 
is that the most of the nation of Israel says, we do not recognize Rehoboam as the king, our king, and they split away. And this is the splitting of Israel. Ironically, Rehoboam's uh, actions are unwise, and the irony is his dad was the wisest guy on the planet, the wisest man to look, right? I just find that kind of interesting. Okay, now, so who does the northern tribes choose as their king? They choose a guy by the name of Jeroboam. Jeroboam, the first king of the northern tribes of Israel, is an evil, evil, bad man. What does he do? He corrupts and pollutes Israel's worship of God. He builds additional temples and places of worship. He, if I remember right, he even like constructs two golden calves for the Israelites to worship. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> it's like, wait, I, what is this? I can't, really? Uh, Professor Benware, Dr. Benware, put it this way. Jeroboam was the man who was the push that led Israel to corruption and ultimately to captivity. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 15. A couple chapters over for it. 1 Kings chapter 15, and then we'll pick it up in verse 25. Because here's what I want to, what I want to key in on here is this. Nadab, the son of Jeroboam, became king of Israel in the second year of Asa, king of Judah. And he reigned over Israel for two years. Nadab, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, walking in the ways of who? His father, Jeroboam. And in his sin, now listen to what how God's word characterizes Jeroboam. In his sin, which he, Jeroboam, had caused Israel to commit. What kind of influence did King Jeroboam have over the entire nation of Israel? He led them to sin, didn't he? He says, listen, you guys come worship God and worship God this way, which is totally antithetical to how God has intended and decreed that he would be worshipped. And he leads a whole nation. In fact, by the way, over 20 times in Scripture, Jeroboam is characterized as the guy who led and made Israel sin. Do you see the the influence he had. And what kind of influence did he have over, over his son, Nadab, who would become the future king? Did Nadab follow in his father's footsteps? Lockstep in every way. Now, now, and then turn, this is, this is crazy, turn it to 2 Kings, so don't go to the 2 Kings, book of 2 Kings, chapter 21. 2 Kings, chapter 21. Oops, too far. 2 Kings chapter 21 begins talking about this uh, one of the kings of Judah. So we're, in, we're not in the northern tribes of Israel, now we're in the Judah, right? And this king is by the name of Manasseh. <laughs> Manasseh? He made evil into an art form. So listen to this. Listen, listen to who influenced him. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for five years. Verse 1, his mother's name was that. In verse 2, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Again, but there's that the evaluation. Here's the characteristic. How, how do we summarize this, his rulership? He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Following the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. Verse 3, he rebuilt the high places his father Hezekiah, who was a really good king, by the way, mm -hmm. had destroyed. He also erected altars to Baal and made an Asherah pole, as Ahab, king of Israel, had done. Ahab, another bad, bad, bad king. He bowed down to all the starry hosts and worshipped them. He built altars in the name of the temple of the Lord, of which the Lord had said in Jerusalem, I will put my name. In both courts of the temple of the Lord, he built altars to all the starry hosts. Verse 6. He sacrificed his own son in the fire practice sorcery and divination. Now, I want to key in one little thing. This, his, his evilness is self-evident, right? Who influenced him? It says, a guy by the name of King Ahab, who was one of the kings of the other, of the northern tribes. 
So the influence, is he now crossing national borders, right? You see where I'm going? And ultimately, Manasseh, by the way, brings exile to Judah. God keeps his word from Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 30. It's not in your notes. I'm writing this down. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 30 is a key verse to understand the events of the books of First and Second Kings. It is where God says, listen, you disobey me, I will punish you. I will scatter you for the whole purpose of to draw you back to myself. But I will scatter you. And so First Kings, we see him keeping his word after a whole lot of patience and long time. Now, again, in the kings, not all the kings were bad, obviously and clearly. In 2 Kings chapter 23, a couple verses, a couple chapters over. 2 Kings chapter 23 gives an account of Josiah. Josiah is a high point. He is a bright spot. He is like, oh, hope. Oh, they're not all bad. There's actually good kings. And Josiah was, listen to this characterization, chapter 23, verse 25. Now, neither before nor after Josiah was the king. With Josiah was there a king like him who turned to the Lord as he did, with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his strength, in accordance with the law of Moses. Now, that's a king that Israel needs. That's a king that had power, and we would right. And how does it characterize him? Not as one who did evil in the eyes of the Lord but one who loved God with all his heart and with all his strength, with all his mind and all his... You get it? In fact, it, it moved his, his influence. He used his influence. He had a ruthless campaign to rid Israel of its evil worship, worship practices. He goes through the land and he tears stuff down and he, and he restores proper worship of God in the temple and so forth. Here's my question. Who is Josiah listening to? Who is influencing him? God. Right? He's listening to God. He's following God. Uh, don't pretend we have time for this too. I remember the stories in 1 Kings chapter 18 and 19. 1 Kings chapter 18, we have the story of, of Elijah, this great prophet of God. <laughs> oh man. Remember the story? It's, like, it's the battle royale, the battle of the gods. It's the one true God versus all the pagan gods of, of, the, of these horrible nations and practices, right? And Elijah stands before hundreds and hundreds of, 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 of um, the prophets and priests of these foreign and despicable gods. And he stands before them and says, listen, I'm going to prove today, God's going to prove that he's the one true God. And so they have the, the whole altar and the whole... Um, What's the word altar? Is that the word? Wow, I'm losing it. And they pile all the wood and they say, okay, whatever God calls down fire from above and consumes this, this, this pile of stuff will, will be shown as the one true God. And so he says, listen, all right, you guys go first and you guys call on your gods to consume this. And then they, they're crying out and they're cutting themselves and they're just being idiots and they're going crazy and they're dumping water on it and all this stuff and ain't nothing going to happen. And then what does Elijah do? He stands up and says, all right, God, your turn. What does God do? Consumes it. Fire. Whoosh. And he defeats. In fact, he has all these false prophets and all these false... He has them killed, right? This is great. I mean, God is shown as the one true, all-powerful God who is the one worthy to be followed, who is the one who should have complete influence over our lives. And then in chapter 19, the next chapter talks about what? Jezebel says, you killed all my prophets. You killed all my guys. I'm coming after you. And what does this great, powerful prophet of God who's just seen God do the incredible, what does he do? Tuck his tail and run like a scared little puppy. From one person. Really? By the way, I think part of the reason this is in there is because it's looking like Hey, Israel, as a nation, look what I've done for you over and over and over again. And by the way, if one little nation pops up and gets all a little upset with you, are you going to listen and be all worried and freak out, or are you going to listen to me? 
Because I have delivered you from the hand of the evil over and over and over. 400 times. You get the idea. So here's Elijah. Who is he listening to on the first chapter of 18 when he stands before all these other prophets? Who's he listening? Who's he trusting to? Who is influence over him? God. Verse 19, when he's running away like a scared puppy, who's he listening to? Jezebel. There's some principles in it. It should really cause us to pause and be, make a somber realization that you know what? We are all just as capable of running away despite whatever great things we've seen God do in our lives. If the great man of Elijah, the great prophet of God, could be distracted and listen to someone else, I think we should probably be a little more careful. Okay. We would do well to answer the question of what did Elijah forget and what do we need to remember? Okay, here's my main point. We are all being influenced we are all influencing others. The truth of the matter is, we are all being influenced, and we are all influencing others. <clears throat> the question is, first, who are you influencing? What kind of influence are you exerting? Godliness? Goodness? Gentleness? Self-control, patience. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 says this. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. What kind of influence are you exerting? Are you helping propel your friends and neighbors towards goodness and towards godliness and towards Christ? Maybe like a King Josiah. Husbands, wives, how are you propelling and spurring on one another? What kind of influence are you? Parents, it's a bit sobering for me right now, by the way. Grandparents, employers, employees, customers, customer service reps, drivers, when I drive, what kind of influence am I? Mm. Let's get too personal, I'll be quiet. Neighbors, are we rocketing people towards Christ? Am I? Does my time, my words, my social media, does it reflect or echo the heart of God or not? Now, Second question, on the side of the coin, who is influencing you? Who's influencing me? Who has final say in our daily lives? How can you tell, by the way? I think, as I've mulled this over the past couple weeks, I think we can tell who has, we can answer the question, who's influencing me and you by looking at our keeping, our spending, and our keeping. Put it this way. Uh, how are you spending your time? Time spent, we all, I'm going to cut right to the quick on this. Maybe, I'll just say me. Maybe it applies to you. Spend entirely too much time in front of a screen that is screaming at me, influencing me. And I wonder why it carries so much sway in my life. Money spent, follow your money, you'll see your heart. That's the spending part. Keeping, uh, what kind of company are you keeping? Proverbs, by the way, the wise written, much, you know, Proverbs, these great uh, wise statements, <laughs> written by, I don't know, Solomon, you know, talks a whole lot about the value of good friends, doesn't it? What kind of keeping, what kind of company are you keeping? Is it with good people who are, who are goading and propelling and pushing and influencing you towards Christ-likeness, or are they not? And who's keeping your emotions? 
You ever feel like you're a rocket about to explode? I know I'm beating this illustration to a pulp, but hang in there. You ever feel like you're a rocket about to explode? Emotions are just getting... I, is it a rocket that is, is going to propel you to, to good things and to godliness and to something good and something practical and worthwhile? And, or is it just going to explode in destruction? Who's keeping your emotions? What is influencing your emotions? I'll tell you this real quick. I found myself in an office um, the other day, and they had a screen on, they had a TV on, and I'm watching it. And I, and I had to sit there a long time. And the whole time, the screen, it was just like this constant barrage. And I found myself just getting worked up. And I sat there and I'm like, I'm getting worked up. My, I'm getting ramped up. <laughs> really? Why does that have so much influence on me? My emotions are telling me who has influence on me. What changes do I need to make? What changes do you need to make? See, we all know, just as it was for Israel, that the primary, the soul, the ultimate influence in our life is to be God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 through 9. Read this with me. The Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with what? All of your heart with all of your soul, with all of your strengths. These commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Boy, that speaks to influence, doesn't it? Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands or bind them on your foreheads. Write them in your door frames of your houses and on your gates. Who is to, who is to have the ultimate say in our lives? Way back in the beginning, God says to Israel, he says to us, and look at Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. Jesus says to all of us, you shall love the Lord your God, what? With all your, with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. Does this sound familiar? This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commands hang all the law and the prophets. Do you see who is supposed to have the final say in your life and my life? From the beginning of the end to the Genesis all the way to Revelation on through eternity, God is the one true God that we are to worship, and everything in our lives should bow to him. He is to be the rocket. We strap our lives and our, day, our Mondays and our Tuesdays and our Wednesdays and our, and, our, and our retirement and in our child-rearing years and in our adolescence. We climb on and we hang on to Jesus. They say, God, I'm going with you. Why? Where does God lead us to? He leads us to life. Do you, does God's word have influence over your life? Does it have it on mine, even though I'm a pastor? I can stand up here and I can preach every week. And maybe give an okay sermon every week. I should try that sometime. <laughs> but I could do this and still refuse to let God's word change me. So I'm not standing up here pointing the finger at you and you alone. I'm saying, hey, <clears throat> does God's word have influence in my life? Do I know it? Am I learning it? Yeah, I don't, am I studying it? Am I memorizing it? Am I allowing it to change me? Am I applying it to my life? Trusting that God's ways, his word, is the best for me. Am I allowing God to transform and change me? Because the reality is God's desire for you and for me is what? Is good. Is good. He's leading us to something rich and full and abundant. And I know I'm not talking about monetary. I'm talking about something far more valuable than a few bucks. That the life God has for us is a life that is good. It is a life characterized by peace and by hope and by love and grace and mercy and everything that we all want and ten times over. And to cap it all off, he's leading us to an eternal life with him forever in a very real place called heaven that is a very really good things of things like you know no more pain no more sorrow no more tears go right on the line and the best part about heaven is what jesus is there and we will get to be with him forever 
That's where God is leading us to. That's where his influence is pulling us to. That's where he wants to propel us to. Let me close with this. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 and 25. Jesus says this to his disciples. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will or must lose it. And whoever loses their life for me will what? Fight. See, the reality is all of us have a choice to make. Because the reality is our sin in our life breaks that relationship. We're torn apart and we're ripped away from a good and peaceful and awesome relationship with God. We rebel against him, but yet God, out of his love for us, sent his one and only son to die on the cross, to rise from the dead, to be the atoning, sacrificial substitute for you and for me so that anyone who calls on him will be forgiven and have eternal life with him. That the relationship will be restored. And how is that done? It is when we come to God and say, God, I'm sorry for what I've done. My, my life is now yours. I need your forgiveness and your grace and your mercy and the work of Jesus applied to me. You are now my king. You influence over me. And in doing so, for God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him will have what? Everlasting life. We give him the, our lives that is leading to destruction. And we give him influence in, over our lives that he transforms us into an eternal life with him forever. That make sense? Who's influencing you? And who are you influencing? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the sobering accounts of these evil kings. Thank you for the hopeful accounts of the good kings. And thank you for the hope that is found in you, our one true and eternal king who came to save all who call on you. This week, Lord, may we trust you. May we be influenced. Influence isn't the right word. I'm trying to find a new one. But may we, may you truly be king of our lives. Tomorrow, whatever tomorrow holds, may we, we approach it by saying, God, what do you want? How should I act? How should I react? How should I speak? How should I? So help us and guide us this week as we guide us more to your character, your love, and who you are. And thank you that above all that when we choose you, and we choose to ask for your forgiveness, you actually offer it and you give us eternal life. That you exert your almighty power and influence to thrust us into eternal life with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord, would you all please rise.